So we have this wonderful reading that was given to us this morning from the Gospel of Luke. The thing is, it's not just a reading. It's actually set out in the text as a poem. But the thing is, it's not just a poem. It's a song. And you know me. I love music. That's wonderful that it's a song. In the great tradition of uh, biblical writers, Luke has included a song. In fact, Luke has 12 songs in the entire gospel. Four of those songs are right here at the beginning, and each of them point in other centrality of the truth that the gospel is speaking of. So, here's this one. And I wonder, why do they have to break into song? Well, you know the answer to that. You've seen musicals, right? It's the best. People go along talking and talking, blah, 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 blah. And then comes the part where their motivation and their aspirations are revealed. And there's no more blah, blah, blah. Now it's the hills are alive with the sound of music. Okay, that dates me, I understand. But it was on TV the other night, right? When you go to singing, you're talking about something that's right at the heart of the matter. There's no holding back. Why is singing so powerful? Well, research has been done that tells us why. When we sing, our endorphins and our oxytocin levels rise. We feel better. We feel good. We're more emotionally healthy, which would lead us to say that perhaps our choir is the most emotionally healthy part of our church. Yeah, there you go, yeah. Woo! Of course, we all know they're a little crazy, but they are emotionally healthy. Yes. <laughs> the other thing that the choir gets, and we get some of too, is when you sing together, when you sing with other people, research shows that your heartbeats begin to align. Ka-thump, 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 ka-thump. Wow, to feel at one with others. So this singing thing really has something to it. It tells the emotional center of what it is that's trying to be expressed. It is healthy for you therapeutically and emotionally. But, 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 but why? I mean, why can't we just read the words on the page and just let it kind of, you know? The reason is, when you sing, you have to step into it. You have to step into the song. You have to embody the words with your body, physically, with your voice. It's a tremendous Tremendous thing. I, just by the way, the research also shows, and uh, you know, I, I don't want to point anybody out about this, but uh, Steve, um, <laughs> you don't have to have a perfect voice <laughs> to get all of these benefits. It's just, you, you know, you've said to me many a time, but you know, I don't have a, a, a perfect voice. Oh, you're talking about me. I should have known. Kaching, you're so good. Well, isn't it the truth? You don't need to have a perfect voice. It's not simply about performance. It's about stepping into this place where you embody what the message is. And... Mary has done this in this song. She has done it so much that she changes tenses on us. She says, future generations will bless her. And then she says, because God has sent the rich empty away. God has filled the poor with good things. God has 
taken the powerful down from their thrones and lifted up the poor. She has entered into this song so much, it is as if it has already happened. It's happening right now. You know, she trusts the message and the power and the truth of God so much that she feels it happening inside of her, and she steps forward and sings it. It's a tough message. You heard it there, right? This message about the powerful being taken down, thrown down from their thrones. The rich being sent empty away. It's a powerful one. You know, when the first missionaries went to Africa, when they uh, taught the native peoples there, they didn't teach this poem, this song, because they were afraid that the native peoples there, who were very poor, might be empowered to rise up against their leaders and take them over. So they they didn't tell them that story. Dr. Lois Malcolm, who is a uh, seminary professor, grew up in the Philippines. Her parents were missionaries to the poorest of the poor there. And when this was taught to them, they were blown away that the God of the universe would actually care for them and consider their plight because in their religion they were in a caste system and the caste that you were in if you were a good performer in that caste your whole life maybe in the next life you would be elevated up another level but of course Christians have a a similar twist on its theology you know uh, some say to the poor well If you're poor, you're poor, but you behave and be good people. And then in the afterlife, you'll get your reward. And all those other folks, well, you know where they're going to end up. Of course, there's a secular version of the same theology, which is, um, look, all you have to do is work hard, obey the law, save your money, And someday you'll be rich too. But we know that these theologies, and they're all theologies, are a a much too shallow analysis of the struggles, the chronic ongoing struggles of poverty in the world. So when I wrote the title to the sermon today, What Are You Waiting For? A Throne? I realized later after I'd published it that it was really something uh, that oppressed people, a title that oppressed people might want. Yeah, I'm waiting for a throne, you bet. But, you know, we're Connecticut suburbanites, and frankly, we're some of the wealthiest people on the planet. We're some of the most powerful people on the planet. So maybe I should have entitled the sermon... What are you afraid of? Being toppled from your throne? Because you know, the missionaries didn't teach it to the native peoples because they were afraid of revolution. And of course, the more you have, the more you have to protect. But I'm here to say something, and that is Luke is not preparing people For battle. Luke is not handing out guns to people and preparing the next military revolution. That's not what Luke is up to. You have to read farther in the book to get it. But the whole book has to do with the way of shalom, the pathway of peace, shalom and salvation, peace and justice. And so he lays it out. It's very simple. You can actually see it in Mary here. The pathway is this. You have to listen to God. You have to be willing to obey God 
even if it goes against the grain of your culture. And you have to be able to see the vision that God has. That all people will live together in shalom and salvation. So you have to listen to God. You have to be willing to obey God, even if it goes against the grain of your culture. And you have to be able to see that vision, which is so hard to see because we try to figure it out, right? Well, how are we going to get there? How are we going to do that? But we don't have to have it figured out. We just have to see it, hear what God calls us to do in it, and then step up and sing it out, embody it in our lives, wherever we are. That's what we're called to do, as Luke is telling us here through Mary in this Christmas story. Two examples. Number one, Malala and I can never pronounce her last name, Yusafitz. That could be close. She was born in 1997 in Pakistan. You know the story. Her father ran a school. She very early on came to love education. But in her culture, women were not to be educated. And she stood up against this. She wrote papers about it. She wrote letters about it. She talked to individuals about it. She talked to small groups about it. And even later, she talked to whole uh, auditoriums full of people about it, that women should be educated. Her conviction, her charm, her winning oratory brought many people to her and her message. So many that the Taliban began to be take notice of her. And her parents and Malala talked about this possible threat. Uh, they're violent people. They could kill her. But they thought, no, they would not kill a child. She was only 14 years old when these threats were coming into being. So she kept up the work that she was doing. She kept singing her song. And on a bus, uh, she was riding with other students. The bus was stopped. Members of the Taliban got onto the bus, shot her in the head, and left her for dead. She didn't die. Almost miraculously, she didn't die. And she got back up, and she started singing her song again. Last year at this time, Tamara preached a sermon and talked about Malala. And I bring it back again this year because this year, just a few weeks ago, she shared in the Nobel Peace Prize. She's singing her song, the song of shalom and salvation, of peace and justice in the world. Number two, in St. George's County in Maryland, there was such a struggle between a largely African-American community and largely white police force. However, in fact, there were, there were more killings by police officers there of civilians, mostly black, than any other county in the country. People stepped in. There was a federal investigation. Changes were made. Personnel was changed. Programs were started. And one church, the Community of Hope, AME, pastored by the Reverend Tony Lee, uh, stepped in and began offering programs, particularly uh, for young black men who are involved in gangs. And the situation turned around considerably. Well, following Ferguson, just a month or so ago, things got hot again, and tempers began to flare, and people were on edge, and the leaders in the community were concerned about what it was that was going to happen. So the Reverend Tony Lee, minister of the Community of Hope, calls the white chief of police, Chief McGaw, 
to come with some of his top aides and to speak to his church, 900 people, almost all of them African-American. And so they came into the church. And Chief McGaw got up to speak, and he said this, We are you. Our children go to school with your children. We shop at the same stores you shop at. We are you. Let us remember how far we have come and how far we have to go. Thunderous applause. And then Reverend Tony Lee got up and asked these police officers if they would come to the front of the church. And then he asked the people in the congregation, how many of you have ever been arrested and put into jail, incarcerated? Many people raised their hands. I haven't, by the way. I just raised my hand. <laughs> I, I have been stopped for speeding several times. But... And then he asked, how many people in the congregation have a family member who has been arrested and incarcerated. And so with all those hands up, there was 40% of those 900 people in that congregation who were raising their hands. And he said, I want you people to come forward and to pray for these white police officers. And so... 400 people walked forward. You know, like happens at confirmation here. They put their hands on them, and their hands back and hands back and hands back, and then people began to pray. And they didn't do it nice and orderly like we do, you know, one person at a time so everybody can understand what's going. No, people started praying all over. Oh, God, be with these folks. They're protecting us. Be with them in the dangerous work that they are doing. Help them to complete their work without their lives being lost. Oh God of hope, of peace and justice, please. And it built up into a furor and then, and then it, it came down. Luke is not asking for a revolution. Luke is asking for a nonviolent walk toward peace, where hand in hand we walk together. It is no simple thing. It demands this that you sing your song. It demands that you take that message and not just read it. And not just recite it, not just memorize it, but let it come out of your heart. Say, yes, shalom, yes, peace, yes, justice. Oh, yes, peace. Oh, yes, justice. Oh, yes, the love of God all over us. Black and white, rich and poor. Men and women, straight and gay. This is the Christmas story. Sing it.